Welcome everybody to our very first lecture on chapter one for idioms and expressions. And I'd like to go through each idiom, giving about a minute towards each idiom, just to give you a little bit more in-depth information about it and uh, kind of give you a visual on how these idioms might um, impact our speech. Okay, so the very first one is what's eating you. And that's idiomatic for what's bothering you. There's something that you're not saying and your behavior is being affected by it. I can tell it in the way that you talk or the way that you look or the way that you act. And so we're concerned when we say that. Most of the time we're concerned. We will say, wow, what's, what's eating you? Because you've said something, maybe you said it in anger or I might have said, hey, good morning, what's up? And you might say, hey, just don't bother me right now. And I'll say, well, what's eating you? Because your behavior is not the normal that we're expecting from you. And we just want to know what's getting at you. And with what's eating you, it's more of a physical impact on our body as well, a lot of times, because we are, we're really bothered by whatever it is that we are not telling people. Okay? So we can say, in response, well, what's eating me is the fact you never called me for three days and you said you would. That's what's eating me. So we could put me in the equation if we are answering the question, what's eating you? Okay? And let's take a look at the next one. So this one is to get something off one's chest. And we can take ones here and put your chest, my chest, his chest, their chest. Uh, we can use uh, many different pronouns or even names in this particular place for ones. And there's three ways that we usually use this idiom. We either use it to complain, like I'm upset with you because you always leave dirty dishes in the sink and you're my roommate and you're supposed to help me with that. So you might see your roommate and say, you know what, I've got, I've got to get something off my chest. Okay? Because um, it's bothering me that you are not keeping your commitment. And so I'm complaining about my roommate's inability to do chores and keep his or her commitment. Another thing we can do is confess the second one here. Uh, this one is maybe, in this couple's case on the bench, maybe she's had an affair and she has to tell him and she's been carrying this around her for a long time. She finally decides to do it, and she finds, finally decides to say, hey, I need to get something off my chest. Uh, I had an affair. And, of course, he's very upset after hearing the news, and he's not happy that she got something off her chest, but it was bothering her enough that she wanted to what we call come clean. That's another idiom for meaning I'm going to confess. I'm going to not tell lies anymore. So this is where we we confess a wrongdoing that we've done and we use this this idiom a lot and then the last thing that we could do is uh, give advice usually if we see someone upset about something um, maybe it's an argument that someone had with their mother or father and they've been carrying around the guilt or they've been carrying around the pain of it and you as a friend say you know you got to get that off your chest don't keep it bottled up inside. That's another one, right? You go tell your mom and dad uh, what happened. Just, you'll feel better. Get it off your chest because it's like something sitting on your chest crushing you because of the, the weight of the guilt, okay? So it's always, I got to get something off my chest or we might say, uh, I got to get this off my chest and that's, this is, or something is whatever is bothering you, okay? The next one, I'm just going to use the books. It's to keep bottled up. It goes along with the uh, what's eating you. It goes along with get something off your chest. If you don't talk about your feelings, then they tend to get inside you because you keep them inside yourself. So that's bottling it up like a can of Coca-Cola. And oh, we usually give this an advice. Don't keep keep that bottled up, you're going to explode or you're going to have a nervous breakdown. Uh, you're going to start crying, something. So it's a negative type of thing to have. 
And when someone's telling that to you, they see that you're stressed out, okay? So we say don't keep that bottled up. Sometimes we say inside, sometimes we don't. You could say we don't keep that bottled up inside your head. Um, another way of that of saying this is don't keep that to yourself. Okay, that's another way that we express that. Let it out. Another expression, and it's idiomatic, let it out. In other words, whatever you have bottled inside you, you need to let it out of the bottle so you can release your feelings, you can release your stress. That's causing you to, to keep this situation private. Okay? The next one is uh, have guts. And usually it's followed uh, by two, but... Uh, we don't have to have it followed by two, but I'll give you some examples. So have the guts and then usually to do something. Or we don't have the guts to do something as a general rule. But two does not have to be there, but it often is. Okay. So here, the man in this picture finally got the guts or has the guts to propose to his girlfriend. He's been nervous about it for six months and he finally did it. And so he has the guts to propose. And this have changes to has when the subject is singular. So he has the guts, she has the guts. But when it's I and you or plural, then we go with have. I have the guts, they have the guts, you have the guts. Okay. Now guts is what we refer to as stomach right here. And the stomach is a very central part of our anatomy because a lot of times we, we say we feel emotions. If we get sick to our stomach because we're nervous, sick to our stomach because we are afraid, um, sick to our stomach because we're anxious, or when we say we have butterflies in our stomach, we are saying that we're in love or we're excited, we're anticipating something. So the stomach for us houses a lot physically where we think our emotions live. So when we say have the guts, what we're saying is courage. Do you have the courage to propose to your girlfriend? Do you have the courage to stand up for someone when no one else is standing up? Okay, so that's, that's how we use that particular expression. For the example, this little girl has a lot of guts, actually. She's standing up to this bull. Well, you can really look at it as standing up to your fears or standing up to is also another idiom it just means to face it to encounter it to deal with it okay so she has the guts to face her fears and and go on with it or we can put not in front of it and said you don't have the guts to propose to your girlfriends you uh, she doesn't have the guts to walk across that coal of fire in her bare feet. She doesn't have the guts to break up with him. Okay, so that's how we use it. And it's a very common expression in English. And it just means either you have the courage or you do not have the courage. All right, let's give, give it a shot. So give it a shot is when we, we want to do something. We don't know that we're going to be successful, but we want to do it. But maybe we're afraid of failure. So when you guys first read this story in the first part of the book, there was a guy that, that really liked this girl that he worked with in their office building, and he wants to ask her out or talk to her, but he's really nervous, and he doesn't have a lot of self-confidence. So his friend finally tells him, well, give it a shot. That means give it a try. If you're successful, great. If you're not successful, at least you tried. No harm done. So we use that as, well, you'll either miss the target or you won't miss the target, but no harm done, why not? And so in this partic particular picture, you see this woman that's on the right side here wants to learn how to fly, but she's very, very nervous. So her husband says, why don't you give it a shot? Go up with an instructor, have him fly you around, and see if you, you'd be willing to do it. There's no harm in trying, so give it a shot, honey. It's, we say that any time we want to encourage another human being. So that's, uh, that's what we like to do. So don't worry if it doesn't work out. Should I take this new job? Oh, you're not working right now? Give it a shot. 
If it works out, great. Okay. Uh, what's in the middle here for the grammar? This usually s stays it because whoever you're speaking to knows what it is because you're they're, they know you're trying for a job. They know you want to fly. They know you want to ask that girl out for the date. So we usually don't change this pronoun, but we can. We can say, give asking her out a shot. Give flying a shot. Um, but oftentimes we just keep it to it because the speaker and the listener are already um, in agreement or they're already aware of whatever the situation is. So we can keep that this as it. Okay. Sometimes we can change it. We can say, I'm going to give this a shot. And that's okay too. Uh, okay too. So the next one is wouldn't be caught dead. This is a very, it can be a sarcastic expression. It can be a hurtful expression because it depends on how you use it. You can do it kiddingly, but usually we are saying whatever it is that we're talking about, it's very undesirable. A person, a thing, a place, an action, anything is, we find it so undesirable, unattractive, unappealing, that even in our death, even when we die, we don't want to be seen in that car, we don't want to be seen with that man, we don't want to be seen in that dress, even at death, when you don't care because you're not alive anymore, that's how badly you don't want to do that or be seen in that, okay? Because even in your dead body, you don't even want to be seen with it. So it's very strong. It's very sarcastic. And be careful because it can be very hurtful if it gets back to the person that you said this about. So, for example, let me give you the next slide. Oh, I wouldn't be caught dead dating that guy. Well, look at the happy face on it. Actually, he's kind of handsome. But anyway, he's uh, he's so happy, and he really, really wants to please her and charm her. But for some reason, this woman does not want to date this guy, to accept his flowers, to be seen with him. And she doesn't want to be caught dead even talking to him. Okay? So, but if you say that to your friend, or if you even say it to the person... I wouldn't be caught dead dating you. It's very strong, very sarcastic, very hurtful. Say it to your best friends who you know wouldn't say anything because if you say it to someone's face, it's very, it's, it's very, very hurtful. Uh, some of my friends actually would, would say, well, I wouldn't be caught dead voting for Trump in the next election. election. Now, however you feel about politics, I'm not telling you to feel one way or the other. I'm just telling you my experience. I wouldn't be caught dead voting for Trump. They, that's how strongly they feel about him having another presidency. Okay? Let's go to the next one. Skip it. We say this in conversation, and I, it happens a lot in marriage, by the way, too. But it's when you don't want to talk about something, generally, and the other person is persistent. They want you to talk about it. Or give you more, or have you give them more details, but you're not interested. So skip it means to move over this topic, skip over it like you're hopping, or on a jump rope, you're hopping over it. Okay, you want to hop over the topic because you don't want to address the topic. So skip it means go on, move on. Uh, never mind. It's not important. It doesn't matter. Don't want to talk about it. Forget about it. Okay? So as you can see, this woman is not pleased. He wants to hear. She doesn't want to talk. And um, we say skip it. Now, this happens, too, in marriages. A lot of times when you're talking and you can't really hear the person or the person's not really understanding. Hey, honey, I want to, I want to go to this movie. How come? Oh, well, it's a love story. And, you know, it'd be romantic. Well, you know, this is this is my football night and I don't like love stories and you know why that one well you know you and I haven't been together in a while and well why don't we go do and do this and that instead and she just says well you know skip it just skip it okay so that's it's usually an annoyance um, 
we can say it a little bit more politely and we could say, you know, let's move on or let's just skip this. That's a little bit more than just saying, you know what, skip it. Um, you wouldn't say that to a boss in a meeting. He's talking about something you don't want to hear it. You want to say, oh, Mr. Rogers, let's just skip it. <laughs> that I wouldn't recommend you do that. Usually you, you can say skip it. We're in a, you're in a situation where you have the, the standing, the authority, the, the place to say that. Okay, But usually boss to employee, that's not something you're going to say. And probably not to a police officer, okay? Um, because you don't have the authority to tell the, the police officer, oh, you know what, just skip that ticket, okay? Just skip it. All right, let's talk about the next one, bite the bullet. Bite the bullet is comes from the old cowboy days when, well, they say anyway, when cowboys were riding on horses and they didn't have any medicine that would, that you could make the pain go away while someone's operating or digging a bullet out of your arm because you got shot. Um, so what they used to say is they would give whoever was being operated on either some whiskey. If they didn't have whiskey, they gave him a bullet. He could bite on the bullet just for to bite on something to tolerate the pain. But bite the bullet now is idiomatic for whatever it is that you don't feel like doing, give up, give in, surrender and do it anyway. Usually when you bite the bullet, you still don't want to do it when you do it. Oh, you know what? Bite the bullet and go on that diet. You've been talking about it for six months. Um, you know what? You and your ex-wife, she got the car and the divorce. You better give up those car keys, man. Just bite the bullet and give it back because she's going to win in court. So he's giving back the car key. He's going to bite the bullet because he figures he's going to need to do it even if he doesn't want to. So that's um, that's any time we don't want to, to do something, but we're going to. Um, your book says on page eight, your book says that um, they went ahead and bit the bullet and got married. Well, that's kind of an odd idiom to say when you want to get married because hopefully you want to get married because it's it's a fun thing, you're in love, it's it's an amazing time. So usually we wouldn't say, oh, well, just go bite the bullet and get married because marriage should be something you want to do. But maybe a friend is talking to another friend and he wants to just keep dating her forever and ever. And he just says, you know, dude, bite the bullet. Go ahead, make the commitment, jump in and do the right thing. Okay? So... That's what we have when we say bite the bullet. And we can put this in the future. We can put it in the past. We can say, hey, they bit the bullet. They got married. Notice that I could put it past. They bit the bullet. Um, do you guys think they'll get married? Yeah, they'll bite the bullet. They will bite the bullet and go ahead and do that. So this is a uh, tense. We can change it. We can put a modal will or we can change bite to bit if we put it in the past. We have uh, another one here on page eight. We can put something off, put it off, or put off. And put something off, here we've got a gal that she's sleeping on the beach. Who doesn't like to do that? Well, she's putting something off. She's probably putting her homework off. So we can put anything here. Put the homework off. Put getting married off. Uh, Put doing the dishes off. So anything can be substituted for something put calling my mother off, you know, something like that. So I might say to a friend, oh, I'm putting off um, calling, calling about my mortgage. How come you're putting it off? So my friend would use the it pronoun. Or she could say, why are you putting off your mortgage? But most of the time we say, why are you putting it off? Or why'd you put it off? Okay, so putting can actually be put in the ing form. So, or it can just be put in its simple form, put it off. But when we say put off, and we can do that, when we say put off, what we're talking about is put off plus a gerund. Let me go to this next one. So here I'm putting something off, but I can put off 
going to the dentist. I can put off calling my landlord. I could put off doing my homework. So when you just say put off, you just say put off without something here. You have to have a gerund. He put off tying his shoe. He put off proposing to his girlfriend. So um, anytime you just have put off, you'll need a gerund after that. Okay. So she put off going to the dentist. She put it off. Hit it off. All right. Hit it off means that for the first time you see or do something, mostly when you meet someone, it's generally, we usually say this when things that are alive meet for the first time and they really get along. Um, they like each other. They, they feel comfortable around each other. It doesn't have to be romantic. In this case, this couple maybe went on a first date and they really hit it off. So this couple is got romantic very quickly and that's because they hit it off right when they saw each other. We call that chemistry. I don't know what it is in your language when two people meet and oh, everything, you love everything about them, their personality, their looks, their mannerisms, their speech, whatever. And uh, so we say, as an American idiom, we say they hit it off. Um, and But it can be friendship and it could be animals actually too. Um, so you, you have a dog and you bring home this kitten and oh, they just, when they first meet, they just trust each other from the beginning and there's something that attracts them to each other as friends and you're comfortable. I guess that's the biggest thing. You're comfortable around this person that you can let your guard down and you can um, be yourself. Okay. So I put up a, a video this week on that'll be the day and I put Linda Ronstadt who's a singer, very famous singer in the United States, who sang the song, That'll Be the Day, because her boyfriend kept telling her, you know what, if you don't treat me right, I'm going to break up with you. And she goes, that'll be the day, because she knows how in love he is with her. So when she says, that'll be the day, she's saying, it will never happen. You're not going to do it because you treat me so well. You give me all these flowers. You tell me how much you love me. And no matter what I do or say, you are always there. And she says, that'll be the day. In this picture, let's say that you have this dream and your dream is to be a rock star playing a band. You sing terribly and you can't play a musical instrument and you can't keep a beat. Um, it's just not your thing, okay? But you tell your friends, hey, I'm going to go be in a rock band. I'm going to be a rock star. And they're good friends of yours. So they, they tell you the truth and let you know how it is. And so... So they say, uh, yeah, Josh, that'll be the day, dude. It's not going to happen is what they're saying. Hell will freeze over. Pigs will fly. Uh, something that no one expects will happen if you become a rock star. That'll be the day. It means it's not going to be not going to happen. And we put the emphasis and the stress on that'll. It means that will. Okay. And we contract that most of the time. Rarely will we ever say, well, that will be the day. We don't, we don't say each word individually because this idiom, we emphasize that'll, that'll. So we say, that'll be the day. Because you notice how much louder we say that first word, okay? We don't say that'll be the day. It's that'll be the day. All right. Uh, next one, take the initiative. So when you take the initiative, you start something. You're the one that takes action. And it's usually something new. It's the first step in doing something. You don't wait for anyone else to tell you to do it. So we tell this to teenagers all the time. We say, look, take the initiative. I shouldn't have to tell you how many times to do your chores. In this situation, in this picture, we have a guy pointing at a woman who's wearing her scarf, a cute hajib, and she doesn't look happy. She, she looks distressed. And the other people in the background are not doing anything. We, we don't know if these two people are in agreement with whatever this guy's saying to her to make her feel bad, or if this one girl is shocked, but she's not doing anything, so she's not taking the initiative. Neither is this guy. 
Okay, but this woman over here sees what's happening and she stands up and she's, she's talking to these three people and she's telling them, look, you need to have more patience. You need to have compassion. Um, you need to put your prejudices aside. It doesn't matter that she's different religion or culture. You need to stop harassing her. So no one else was doing anything, but she took action. She started the conversation about, I'm not going to let you talk to this woman that way. We can use take the initiative in many different tenses. We can say, he took the initiative. Like that happened yesterday. Yesterday, she took the initiative to stop the man from bullying this poor woman. Um, when I be become a police officer, I will take the initiative and be compassionate to my public that I serve. Um, I am taking the initiative right now to talk to you about this idiom. So I used it um, in the past. I can use it in the perfect. I have taken the initiative in the past to defend someone. That's the past perfect. I will take initiative. That's, um, that's the future. I will have taken the initiative if I need to. So this is, this is uh, tense specific. You can use it in any tense. The initiative was taken by the woman. See, we can make it passive. Okay. Now you're talking. I, I put uh, an example of that uh, earlier in my lecture, but now you're talking is when something you expected was not, it did not meet your standards. It did not meet your expectations in the beginning. So let's say the father, the girl has four teeth pulled and oh, he feels bad for her. So he says, we're going to get an ice cream. And well, four teeth pulled, she just an ice cream. She, she was okay with it, but she really felt like she deserved more. So she's kind of has a sad face in the beginning. And then dad comes back with two ice cream cones and the kid never gets two. And she's, ah, oh, now you're talking dad. Now you're talking. So when we say that, we are now satisfied with the improvement of the situation. So let's say you're negotiating your pay, and you want a higher pay, and the person, you're, you're a very skilled person, and you're a CPA, and you sit down, and you're a certified public accountant, and they say, well, we're going to offer you $20, $20 an hour. And you look at them surprised and disappointed. And then they say, oh, well, maybe $25. You're, you're very experienced, $25 an hour. And you say, oh, I'm sorry. This, you know, I, I have 15 years experience. I have a CPA license. I think I, I will go to the next company who could really use an outstanding CPA. Well, this company really wants you. And they're like, oh, you know what? You're right. You're right. We're going to pay you $50 an hour and or $100 an hour, whatever it is, and to just to keep you. And you look at them and you put your hand out to shake their hand and say, now you're talking. So something in the past did not meet your expectation. It disappointed you. It fell short of being what you wanted. And fell short is an idiom meaning that it did not come up to the expectation that you wanted. And then whatever happened... The person decided to make it good for you. The person decided to meet your expectations. And now you can say, now you're talking. Now you're talking. Okay? It's a casual form, um, but we use it a lot. Our next Id idiom is to be bound to. And be bound to means a, a certainty to happen. We, we think it's likely or probable that if you do X then why will happen? If you go to the gym every day, work out on these heavy weights, or you're committed and you do the routine, you are bound to get the muscles like this Superman right here. Okay, With all this workout and all this dedication, you are bound to get the good results. It's likely that you're going to get more muscle. It's expected that you will get more muscles. Okay. Um, it can be positive or negative, but there's always a B verb, and that B verb changes. He is bound to look like Superman. I am bound to get the job because I have been preparing. 
Uh, school is bound to be closed because there's a flood in the parking lot. We are highly expecting something to happen because of the evidence. There's strong evidence to make us think that there, it's likely, be bound to just means likely to happen. We expect it to happen. Okay. The next one is pass up. Pass up can be negative or positive. And you could pass up on many things. Hopefully, every one of you have passed up on drugs. Someone offered you marijuana, someone offered you, I'm not making any judgment, so we'll just skip marijuana. Let's just say some heroin or uh, crack cocaine or something. Hopefully, you passed up that opportunity because it's not good for you. But something that is good for you, let's look at the Eiffel Tower um, in Paris. Let's say your friend goes, I'm going to Paris and I'm going to buy your plane ticket and the hotel rooms, come with me. You can't pass up this opportunity because it's fantastic and I'll pay for everything. Well, pass up, usually when we say don't pass it up and we make it negative, that means we want you to do it. Don't pass up the opportunity to go to Paris. Don't pass up the opportunity to go to the study group because you're going to get an A on your paper. So when we make it negative, we mean don't lose the opportunity to do something. But when we make it positive, we want you to not do it. Like, you need to pass up on, on, that, uh, on that car. That car is a wreck. That man's trying to sell you a car. Pass it up because it's, it's a terrible car. So when it's in the positive, you shouldn't do it. And when it's in the negative, you should do it, which is kind of odd, don't you think? Okay, so um, just use it. Just remember, in the negative, don't pass it up means go do it. And when we say pass it up, we mean don't do it. So let me leave with this example here. I'm going to take pass up and putting it off. Okay, so remember when we were at the dentist office and we wanted to pass up the opportunity to go to the dentist? Oh, I'm sorry, we were putting off. We wanted to put off going to the dentist because dentists you know it's people are working on your teeth and we want to put off going to the dentist however what if I told you the dentist that you used to go to is retired and now he's got his new dentist in there and he is single and he is handsome and he is available and he has he likes to work on teeth and you've got teeth, you're perfect for each other, okay? So I might say, stop putting off going to the dentist and don't pass up your opportunity to meet the single doctor that's working there, okay? So I could say that. So if I wanted to say something really positive for you, let's, let me just put it this way. I would say, Stop putting off going to see the dentist. See how they're both negative because I want you to do it. Don't pass up the opportunity to meet the new single good-looking dentist that is now working there. Aha! See? There's my idioms and I put them in the negative. This negative um, shows I want you to take the opportunity in both situations. Okay, that is chapter one. Um, there are going to be some assignments and activities for you to do this week so you can get to know it better. You're going to go into the discussion board and talk about the three idioms and your personal life. And you're going to talk to other students. I hope you have a great week. I hope this lecture helped. And I look forward to seeing you in class.